This is Pastor Gabriel Swaggart, and how delighted and excited that we are to have you joining us for today's Crossfire service. Before we get into our service here today, which I promise it will be a blessing, I want to just say this if I can. We have received so many letters and emails from all over the world, from young people, young adults, and adults telling us how much that this Crossfire program has been a blessing to them, how much it's meant to them. And I, I, it's, it's amazing to hear the testimonies from young people telling us that we're understanding the message of Jesus Christ and Him crucified greater than what we've ever known before. They're seeing victory in their lives like they've never known before, and we thank the Lord for that. So before we get into our message today, we're gonna take you into Family Worship Center from one of our past services to, to hear praise and worship anointed by the Holy Spirit that's going to be a blessing. And then we're going to go take you right into the crossfire service. So don't move a muscle. Today's program is going to be a blessing. Amen. Don't you feel the presence of the Lord here tonight? Amen. He's here to meet your need. Thank you, Jesus. Can we just worship him in this place?
Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse number 12. I'm just reading the 12th verse tonight. Paul would write, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts thereof. And I want to use for a subject, ministering just for a few moments tonight, the reign of terror has ended. And you think, what, what are you talking about? When I refer to terror, I'm talking about the sin nature. The reign of the sin nature, the reign of terror has ended. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for what you have done and what you are doing amongst us. Lord, I ask that you would anoint us as we minister, anoint us as we teach tonight. Anoint our ears to hear what you would have us to say. We ask it all in the name of Jesus hiding behind the cross. I ask that you would ever increase as we would ever decrease, and we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. As you have noticed When you read the first 11 verses of the sixth chapter of Romans, you're reading about the very foundation of Christian living, the cross. I've said this before, but allow me to say this one more time, that without the cross of Christ, Christianity is no different than any other man-made religion. Without the cross of Christ at its focal point, and as its focal point. Christianity is no different from any other man-made, self-made belief system. It is the cross that separates Christianity from everything else. Because in all other religions, you may have one person's thought or one person's belief. But when it comes to Christianity... And when it comes to the Word of Almighty God, you're reading the very epitome of God's love toward mankind. You read about the creation of man. You read about the fall of man. But thank God that you don't just stop right there, but that you begin to read about God's plan to bring man back. And it's all centered upon Jesus Christ and His finished work. When you begin to study these first 11 verses of Romans chapter 6, as I mentioned, you're reading all about the cross. You're reading the fact that you, as a believer, the moment that you accept Jesus Christ, you have been baptized into Christ. You have been baptized into His death. You've been buried with him by baptism into death, and you have been raised with him in newness of life. You read about and you study about, and we've studied over the last several weeks, how that the old man is dead. The old man that you used to be, the individual that you used to be before conversion, he no longer exists or she no longer exists. That now there is a new person. My Lord. There is a new creation that is found in Jesus Christ. You look back at the way you used to be and the person you used to be and the fool you used to be and look at you now. All I can say is look at you now. Some of you were bound by drugs. Some are bound by alcohol. All of us bound by sin. But you can tell the devil, devil, look at us now. We're no longer bound by that old man. But a new man has risen, a new man in Jesus Christ, a new woman in Jesus Christ. Jesus paid it all. We sang about it a moment ago. Oh, to him, oh, sin had left a guilty stain, but he washed it. He took it out of the way at Calvary's cross. He took it out. He removed it, and thank God he did because now I'm a new creation. I'm not bound like I used to be, but I am a new person in Jesus Christ. Glory to God. Thank God 
for Jesus. Thank God for the cross. I'd rather have the cross, I'd rather have Jesus than anything else because Jesus can take your wrong, put it into his right, and make everything all right. The cross still works, ladies and gentlemen. My Lord. You read about how that death has no more dominion over me because death has no more dominion over Christ. And because of that, I want to say it again, death has no more dominion over me. So you hear and you read about the importance of Jesus Christ and the cross. In Romans chapter 5, Paul deals with justification. The first 11 verses of Romans 6, he deals with the cross. Without the cross, there is no justification. And without the cross, there is no sanctification. Without the cross, there's no baptism with the Holy Spirit. Without the cross, there's no healing. Without the cross, there's no deliverance. Without the cross, there's no blessing. Without the cross, there's no forgiveness of sin. Without the cross, there's nothing. But with the cross, I said, but with the cross, we have everything. And we can have everything that he paid for. So you read about the cross. And I don't know about you, you can't get tired of reading about the cross. You can't get tired of reading the fact that I've been buried. I've been baptized into the death of Jesus Christ. That in the mind of God, when Christ died, I died with him. That in the mind of God, when Christ was buried, I was buried with him. And in the mind of God, when he walked out of that tomb, I walked out of that tomb with him in newness of life. You never can get tired of hearing about that. You can get tired of out hearing a few things. But that ain't one of them, to use some incorrect grammar. The cross is everything. But when you get to verse number 12, well, let me say before I get to that, you read once again, Paul says that the moment of your conversion, your old man is dead, gone, never to be brought up or resurrected, that old man. But you get to verse number 12. And Paul takes us just a little bit deeper because Paul was writing to believers. This book of Romans, and really in reality, this book I hold in my hand was not really written for unbelievers. It was written for believers. And when Paul, the great apostle, wrote the book of Romans under the instructions of the Holy Spirit, we get to verse number 12, and he takes us just a little bit deeper because we were talking about justification, talking about the cross, and now we get to where the rubber meets the road, and now we begin to discuss the remaining of this chapter, the seventh chapter, and even into the eighth chapter, the nitty-gritty which is a process known as sanctification. There are three processes, I guess you can say, that will take place in the life of a believer. First of all, justification. Justification is instantaneous. It takes place the moment you say yes to Jesus. You are instantly justified. I mean, in a moment, you are unjustified, and then the next moment, justified. One moment, unsaved, the next moment, saved. One moment, a heathen, and the next moment, born again. One moment, a sinner, and the next moment, a saint. You're talking, my Lord Jesus, I feel that. One moment you are lost, the next moment you are found. One moment you are blind, and the next moment you see. One moment you are dead, and the next moment I'm alive in Jesus Christ. Glory to God. You know, I don't know about you, I feel this tonight. 
It's rolling all over me. Once I was blind, but now I see. That's amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I was once was lost, but now I'm found was blind, but now I can see. Glory. Salvation. Instant, you don't have to jump through a bunch of hoops to get saved. You ain't got to read a bunch of pamphlets to get saved. You don't have to go to so many seminars to get saved. All you got to do is just get down on your knees and say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. You can be in a nightclub. You can be in church. You can be at home. You can be at a bar. You can be anywhere. Because when anybody comes to Jesus, Jesus will rescue them. We've had so many testimonies of people calling in and writing in saying that I was saved. Under this ministry, and you will hear about some of the most random places. Our people would just say that, you know what, I was saved, and I was playing in a nightclub. And all of a sudden, something happened. Like, Papa and my dad were talking about just a few months ago at one of the, a band from the 70s that was popular, I guess it was popular, I wasn't alive back most of the 70s, I was born in 79, so I missed all that, thank goodness. I got stuck with the 80s, my Lord, that was a decade to forget, or something. And yet, this was one of the most evil, demented bands of that time. And one girl began to write the band week after week after week and to say, I'm praying for you. Jesus can save you. And one day, those words stuck in one of the musician's mind and in his heart. They're getting ready to go out and perform a concert, and they're getting ready doing whatever it is that they do, and he's got his guitar on ready to go out, and all of a sudden he says, I can't do this anymore. I just can't do this because that word, Jesus loves me, is getting into my heart. And Lord, if you love me, just take this away from me. And while they were getting ready to go out on the, onto the platform to do their show, he says, boys, I've changed locations. I'm out of here and he's now a preacher of the gospel. Only, only God can do something like that. Only God. Now, let me, I want to tell you another one. A little girl, probably four or five years old, started going to a church, started going to church. They would bring by the buses on this particular street, and they would pick kids up on the buses and take them to Sunday school, take them to church. Her parents were rank sinners. One of them was a stripper. And I don't know what, his, what her father was, but he was up to no good. And yet every Sunday, when she would come home, she would be singing songs that she learned in church. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. And they begin to notice a difference in this little girl. And she kept talking to her mama and daddy about coming to church with her. They said, no, honey, we don't do that. We'll let you go, but we don't do that. They stay up all hours of the night into the wee hours of the morning and sleep all day, pretty much. But one day, curiosity got the best of both of them because they both went to church just to appease their little girl. And when they got to church, Jesus Christ showed up, and he saved both of them and changed their whole worlds. I'm here to tell you, I was once blind, but thank God now I can see. I was once lost, but now I'm found. I've been changed by the power of Almighty God, and nobody, and nobody can tell me otherwise. I've been saved by the blood of the Lamb. I'm saved by the blood of the Lamb. I said I'm saved by the blood of the Lamb, not by works, 
not by means of my own self-effort, not by reading this or reading that or doing this and doing that. It is by simple faith to say, Lord, save me. I can't do it without you. I've come to the end of myself. But, Lord, you can pick me up where I am, and you can turn me around where I am, and you can put me on the right path where I need to be. Glory to God. Mm. So we talk about the old man. I don't want to get on that. We dealt with that already, but it's good stuff. Just think about what you used to be. Just think about what you used to do. Just think about all those late nights clubbing. Just think about all those late nights getting high. Just think about those times getting drunk. Just think about the times you're sleeping around with anybody you can find. Just think about the times that you were doing this, that, and the other. But look at you now. I said, look at you now. Look at you now. Saved by the blood of the Lamb. Your name's written in the Lamb's book of life. You've been changed. You no longer want to do that. But you want to serve Jesus Christ totally and completely. My Lord. Glory to God. I'm saved. Devil, I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm saved. Washed. Bought with a price. Jesus has changed my whole life. If anybody asks you just who I am, you just tell them that I have been redeemed. I'm not the way I used to be. My whole world has been changed. Changed. I traded my old tattered garments for a robe of pure white. I traded all my sin and guilt and shame for righteousness paid for by Jesus Christ. Somebody ought to get this. I'm no longer on my way to hell, but I'm on my way to heaven. I said I'm on my way to heaven. I'm on my way to heaven. If that don't make you happy, I don't know what will. Glory to God. And the best part about it, I didn't have to do anything. It was already done at Calvary. It was a finished, completed work. All I had to do was just say yes. And at that moment, I said at that moment, at that moment, oh, my Lord. Glory to God. I feel that at that moment, I said at that single moment, no matter where you were, Jesus Christ transformed you, gave you a brand new name, and it's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Salvation. But then Paul, well, let me, let me finish that thought. Justification is instantaneous. It is an instantaneous work where the Holy Spirit declares you not guilty. An obviously guilty sinner declared not guilty. But he just doesn't stop there because he takes it a step further. Not only are you declared not guilty, you're innocent. You see, there is a difference between being innocent and not guilty. Not guilty, there's still some doubt. I won't go and use any personal examples in regards to famous examples, but there are people you see on TV, you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, they're guilty. The glove made didn't fit, but he had another glove on beneath it. Mm -hmm. But it was just, all, everyone has their own opinion. Guilty. He just got away with it. God declares you not only not guilty, but innocent. Innocent means it didn't happen. The devil is telling God he did this, she did this, and Jesus looks and said, I don't know what you're talking about. And the father looks down and sees the record and says, it's expunged. I don't see the sin, I see the blood. I see the blood, and when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. Glory to God. Oh, 
not guilty, innocent. But he doesn't stop there. He takes it then a step further. And he looks at you and he looks at Satan and declares you as though you never sinned a day in your life. My goodness gracious. Though you never sinned, even though it is obvious that you have sinned, but in the mind of God, he sees no record of it. He sees Christ. He sees the blood. But then he says, I'm not finished yet. He says, you're not guilty. You're innocent. Though you've never sinned. But then he takes it one step further. Because now you've been placed into Christ. And Christ is perfect. Christ has never sinned. Christ never failed. Christ never did anything wrong. He was perfect. And now that I am in Christ, God no longer sees me. But he sees the perfection of Christ. So he declares me perfect even though I'm not perfect. Even though I fail every day of my life. But he sees Christ, and as long as my faith is anchored in him, do you get this now? So that is instantaneous. Justification is instantaneous. The second process, well, let me skip that for a moment. Let's go to the third process. First process, justification, instantaneous. The third process, glorification instantaneous because the Bible tells me in the in the moment in just a twinkling of an eye we shall be changed where corruption shall put on incorruption mortality will put on immortality that when we're changed we leave from here we go up there never to be brought back down to this place again until the second coming of Christ so it is instantaneous we go to be with Jesus we're speaking of the rapture of the church do you realize church there is nothing in the word of God in regards to prophecy that is left to be fulfilled for the rapture of the church to take place that means it could happen at any moment it means it could happen at this very moment it could happen tomorrow it can happen next week it could happen next year it could happen at any moment we just have to be watchful and ready. But I do believe that before the rapture of the church takes place, there's going to have the greatest, and we're going to see the greatest harvest of souls to come into the kingdom more than what we've ever seen in history. And I'm not speaking of just this church. I'm speaking all around the world. We're going to see a harvest of souls the likes that the world has never seen before. And the Bible tells us that the gospel shall be preached into the uttermost parts of the world, then shall the end be. Do you know right now, at this very moment, when this telecast hits, that over 2 billion people have the opportunity to watch it? When this service airs, over 2 billion people, B, billion with a B, have the chance to watch this channel anywhere in the world. That means if they're in Germany, they can watch it. France, they can watch it. United Kingdom, they can watch it. Africa, they can watch it. New Zealand, they can see it. Australia, they can see it. The Middle East, they can see it. Canada can see it. Central and South America can see it. America can see it. It means that this program is literally being brought to the nations around the world. And at any moment, two billion people have the chance to watch it. Now you think about that statement. I remember I was at a meeting. I was flying home. And I was, it was on a Saturday afternoon, whatever, 
whatever it was. And I, I know it was a Sunday evening. It was a Sunday evening. And I was at the airport. I believe I was in Atlanta, the worst airport in the world. I'm sitting there, and it was the time of service, the evening service. I had service that morning. And I was at the airport. As I mentioned, I was in Atlanta. We were delayed. And, of course, only in Atlanta it gets delayed, it seems like. And I pull out my phone, and I just wanted to see what part of the service that they were in. I believe Joseph was with me at this time. And a Bob was ministering that Sunday evening. And here I am in the Atlanta airport on my phone looking at the service. And I'm seeing people kind of, you know how people do when you got something, you're watching something, they always want to kind of <laughs> sneak in. But how amazing is technology now that I can do that and that you can do that no matter where you are in the world? You think about that. Now, I'm off my subject. Now, let me get back on it. Chasing a little rabbit. Found it, caught it, put it back in the hole. <laughs> you got glorification, which is instantaneous. But then you've got that second process that begins at justification, ends at glorification, and it's not a one-day thing. It is an every single day ordeal. However, sanctification is not just progressive, but it is instantaneous as well. Sanctification is instantaneous and progressive. It's both. Paul would say that you're washed, you're sanctified, and you're justified. Sanctified means to be cleaned up. Justified means to be declared clean. You got to be cleaned up before you can be declared clean, right? So sanctification is an instantaneous, but rather, and also progressive. I remember I was in a southern state. I was there for a meeting on a weekend, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday morning. And Saturday morning, when I got there, they asked me to do a little question and answer with their church. They brought them all together that Saturday morning. I, I did not know the background of the church. I, I had some friends there, but I really did not know the background of the church and some of the people in their background. They believed that sanctification was an instantaneous work, not progressive, but instantaneous. You're sanctified, and that's it. You made it. You've arrived. I didn't know that. And in the midst of the session, a young lady raised her hand. She said, Pastor Gabe, is sanctification instantaneous or progressive? And I said, it's both. And man, when I said that, I felt that, Air gets sucked out of that room. And it got tense all of a sudden. And I thought to myself, what did I just say to cause everyone in their eyes to glare on me like, what you talking about, Willis? I mean, it hit me, and I, I, we got through the seminar, and I turned to my buddy, and I said, what was that that I felt when I said that? He laughed. He said, oh, you got that old background of people believe that once they get to sanctified, but that's it. I said, well, that's not what the Bible says. Because this is a daily, every single day, it is instantaneous and it is progressive. And Paul would say, and I don't have time, I'm running out of time on this. When I start talking, I can't shut up. <laughs> Paul would say, let not sin. Now, first of all, he already said that we're dead to sin. In verses 6, 7, 8, and 9, he says you're dead to sin. It doesn't control you any longer. But then he gets to verse 12 and says, as a believer, don't let sin reign in your mortal body. So first of all, he says that you're dead to sin. But then he, he takes it a little bit further and says you need to stay dead to sin. You don't have to let sin reign in your mortal body. Now, I don't have the time to go. I'm going to have to bring it back next week because I want to look at that word sin because that word sin is of extreme importance. Number one, when you talk about the word sin in this passage of Scripture, you're not dealing with acts of sin. 
but rather you're dealing with the sin nature. In the Greek, it should have been read, of course, as most of you know, the sin, which refers to something specific, the sin nature. The sin nature is what we were born with. Every one of us, when we were born, when were you born? 93, what day? Well, happy birthday. It's the same birthday as my wife. Happy birthday. Birthday, y'all give it up for our young man right here. October 13th. The moment you were born, October 13th, 93, boy, you're a young buck. I was in high school in 93. Keith, I think, Keith, but you were in college in 93. I'm just kidding. But every person that was born, you're born with two natures, the human nature and you're born with the sin nature. The human nature is who you are. What's your name? Chelsea. You were born with a human nature, so you have brothers and sisters? Okay, they know exactly who you are, huh? They, they, they know your little, they know what buttons to push to get you angry, right? Uh, absolutely. Every one of us were born with a sin nature, a human nature. That's our idiosyncrasies, our quirks. My wife will make fun of me with all of my quirks. I've said this before, and I'll say it again. One of my quirks, and this is just how I am, I'm weird like this. You have to forgive me on this. But whenever I get dressed and I put on my shoes and socks, I got to put on my left one first. Left sock goes on, right sock goes on. Left shoe, right shoe. If I do it opposite, I get all messed up. It's just a quirk. It's weird. But every one of us were born with weird quirks. You're weird. But you're also born with a sin nature. That nature we were born with was given to us by Adam. When Adam fell in the Garden of Eden, now I'm wrapping up here, singers, musicians, go ahead and make your way back. When Adam fell in the Garden of Eden at the beginning of time, the moment that he fell, sin entered into this world. Now, Adam did not, it, sin did not originate with Adam. That originated with Lucifer, okay? But when Adam fell in the garden, the moment that he fell, he passed on that nature which is now towards sin and inner bent to do that which is wrong, he passed it to every single human that has ever existed. Our three children, Sam, who will be eight next month in November, Abby will be five in February, Caroline will be one next week, one. And I can remember bringing all of them home from the hospital. I'm looking at Sam as she's eight, and I'm thinking, where did you go? <laughs> looking at Caroline, she's one, almost one, and I'm like, my Lord. Time has just flown. But the moment I held those little girls in my arms for the first time, I knew as beautiful as they were and the flesh of my flesh, the bone of my bone, the blood of my blood, they are my children. They're Jill's children, our girls. But they were born in original sin. They were born with a sin nature, that nature that bent to do that which is wrong. Every one of us are born with that. However, at the moment of conversion, the sin nature now becomes dormant. When you get saved, a new nature comes in. You're born with two, but when you get saved, a new nature comes in and jumps one and removes it from the throne of your life. And that new nature is the divine nature. The Holy Spirit now comes in, takes up residence, for you are now the temple of God, the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit now dwells in you, lives in you, resides in you, and removes off the throne of your life the sin nature. And the sin nature becomes dormant, not removed. That will be done in glorification. But during that time, the sin nature, as the Holy Spirit rules and reigns in your life, this process of sanctification begins where the Holy Spirit continually, daily makes you into the image of Christ to be more like Christ, 
to be more Christ-like. Young people, that's not an easy thing because there's a lot on the inside of us that has to be removed. And all of it has to be centered around self. The Lord doesn't remove the sin nature. Why not? Because we're not robots. He will never violate our free moral agency. If you want to do wrong, he'll let you do wrong. But if you want to do right, he'll let you do right too. He'll never violate our free moral agency. So when Paul talks about sin, understand in certain areas he is talking about acts of sin. But in this area specifically, he's talking about the sin nature. And if you don't understand where your faith must be placed in regards to the finished work of Christ, that sin nature that is now dormant can resurrect itself and control you once again, even though you're a believer. As I mentioned last week, every Christian has more abundant life, but very few are actually enjoying it. And the reason is because the sin nature is dominating their life. Why? I'll cover that next week. So don't miss it. Be here next week. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. I want us to sing that song, Jesus Paid It All. You just sang it just a moment ago. And I want us to just sing that. I had something else planned, but I don't want to do that. I want to sing what you sang, Emily, a moment ago. Young people, Jesus paid it all. He paid everything. And he did it at Calvary's cross. And tonight, as we dismiss, let's gather around this front for a moment. And let's just begin to worship him just for a moment. Let's begin to thank him for paying it all. As they sing it one more time, Jesus paid it all. Just slip up your hands all across this building. And just begin to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus paid it all. Sin has left. But he washed it white as snow. Come on, sing it again now. He paid it all. He washed his white as snow. Come on, sing it one more time right now. Playing softly, I want every head bowed and every eye closed, no one looking around. I feel prompted in my spirit to do this. I had not planned to do this, but I just feel in my spirit to do this. I don't know your hearts. I don't know where you are in your relationship with God. I pray every single person in here is a believer. But if you're not tonight, and you want to make it right with God, no matter where you are watching or listening, you can make this the greatest day of your life by accepting Jesus Christ. Every head bowed and every eye closed. How many would say in this building, and I pray everyone in here is saved. But you're here tonight and say, Pastor Gabe, I'm not saved, but I want to accept Jesus Christ. As my Lord and Savior, just slip up that hand right now. Anybody in this building? I pray everyone in here is saved. I pray everyone in here. For those watching by television, this is for you. Listening by radio, Jesus, can he's paid it all. He can wash you white as snow if you let him. No matter what you've done in your heart, no matter what you've done in your life, Jesus Christ can change you. He can save you. I want every head bowed and every eye closed. And I want everyone to repeat this prayer after me. This is for television, for radio, for the internet. I want you to know God loves you. He died for you. He became flesh. John chapter 1 tells us for one purpose, to go to Calvary 
for you. And it doesn't matter what you've done in your heart or in your life. It doesn't matter what you've been involved in. Jesus Christ can change you. Saying words will not do anything. But believing these words, that's what's going to save you. And I want you to repeat it after me. And I'm, these young people here are going to help say it with you to help give you strength. And I want you to say it right now. Believe it with all of your heart. Dear God in heaven. I come to you. In the name of Jesus. I'm sorry for my sins. The way I've lived. The things that I've done. Forgive me. Wash me. Cleanse me. Me. From, all from all unrighteousness with my mouth, with my mouth I, confess I confess the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus. In, my heart, in my heart I believe, I believe that, God Jesus that God raised Jesus from the dead, from the dead. And, he is alive. and He is alive right now, right now at this very moment, this very moment I believe that I'm, washed, that I'm washed, that I'm cleansed, that I'm, cleansed, that I'm forgiven, that, I'm forgiven that, I that I am saved. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise tonight. Let's sing it one more time. Jesus paid it all. One more time, slip up your hands and begin to worship Him. Just begin to thank Him. Jesus paid it all. Sin had left a guilty state. But he washed it. One more time, sing it before we dismiss. Praise God, praise God. All to him I owe. Thank you for joining us for today's Crossfire program. And as I mentioned before, I pray that this program was a blessing. If you have any prayer requests, any needs, or any testimonies, you can see the Crossfire email address right there at the bottom of the screen. Feel free to send in your emails just to let us know what the Lord has done in your heart and in your life. Thank you for being with us. Don't, don't miss another Crossfire program, and you need to tell others about Crossfire Youth Ministries. We love you. God bless you.